This presentation titled Step It Up, Add a Dash of Resilience to Your Risk Management comes to us from Donna Stockwell. Donna is a professional engineer and certified lead auditor. She helps teams at all levels of the organization understand what makes a good quality organization overall, as well as the individual requirements to make it happen. She also trains team members in a variety of ISO products. And with that, take it away, Donna. Thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Step It Up, Add a Dash of Resilience to Your Risk Management. As Mike said, I'm Donna Stockwell. I uh, want to thank Exemplar Global for having me speak again at this wonderful online expo. I hope that everyone has the time this year to hear all of the speakers. A bit of background about myself. I help organizations since well before the ISO 9001 took root in a variety of industries, most recently in manufacturing. So we have a mandate in ISO 9001 family to implement the quality management system to be able to identify risks and opportunities associated within its context and objectives, and to use risk-based thinking and all aspects of planning, implementing, and auditing the quality management system. So jumping right in, we have an operations graph here. The company is running normally, and we have an event that occurs which limits or stops the company. This graph is quite generic and can be used on an individual machine, a production line, an individual process, and a department, or even the whole company. So let's take this apart. We have an operational level and quality on the vertical against the time across the page. The graph starts off on the top left, showing your company operating normally at number one. And then suddenly some event happens at number two, and the operating status crashes down to the bottom. This can be a partial or a full shutdown of operations. Could be the machine, and that's easy enough, although there's a known amount of time and resources uh, involved. But let's say it's more complicated. What if it's the whole line or the whole process or the whole company even? What would it take to start climbing to be partially operational at an acceptable level and then fully operational? The recovery time starts by about three and uh, by four, most are an acceptable amount uh, to limp along until the rest of the operations become normal at number five. So for the rest of this talk, I'll focus a little bit more on the process uh, or the whole company. Let's review for a moment what risk is and risk management in the process, and then we'll get back into the nitty gritty. So here, remember that an event could be positive or negative event. It could be one occurrence, several occurrences, or even a non-occurrence where someone, something is supposed to happen um, and it didn't happen. Um, it can also be a change in circumstances. So events have always uh, causes and usually have a, um, uh, consequences. Events without consequences are usually referred to near misses, near hits, close calls, incidents, lots of variety of uh, names for those. So this table has uh, 20 different types of risks all jumbled up uh, as if it was a brainstorming and the team just offered other suggestions. So how are we going to manage them? We put a system together to coordinate uh, where the chance of one or more of these events from a round room meeting, and remember the round room is all of the top management uh, getting together uh, with the intention of everyone uh, inputting and understanding. Uh, so we've already done some risk identification and for the entire life of the organization, um, just please think of uh, adding and updating um, that list. So what's important here is to understand the nature of your business and how flexible it can be. And when I mean the organization, I usually mean how tolerant the top management is willing to be. And I'm going to get into a little bit more detail on that. There's lots of risk models. Um, I start just that you start with a simple one with one event and then add and mix some of the other events in and see what falls out in the end. So we have a simple model 
um, something happens, you react, preferably it goes according to plan, and then there's a, a fallout, and hopefully there's some post-analysis to see what can be done um, for the future uh, so that uh, this event doesn't happen again, or even more uh, uh, lessened. Uh, so now we'll add some complications. Uh, it quickly gets out of control, and with each added new event, um, don't forget to shake out all the all the consequences of note, both negative and positive. And you can see I put some where one um, set of consequences are, are cascaded, but they could happen uh, simultaneously as well. So what are we going to do about it? With all this business attitude that we mentioned earlier based on costs and effectiveness, we'll be able to make a decision to control, reduce, transfer or even accept uh, the event that that it should happen and um, also discuss the potential consequences and any suitable or sufficient re recovery measure um, that might be needed um, there might be some need to call in experts to to read uh, reach a decision um, lawyers accountants um, other strategists environmental um, experts etc and don't forget that this should be treated as a controlled document. So document everything um, and keep the, the notes. And then um, when you come and revisit that uh, later, um, it'll be like an extra viewpoint, especially if there's a change in management. So we've put a, together a skeleton uh, risk management system and now we want to improve some of the parameters. Um, I've just shown 10 here. There's more and there's uh, also some uh, subtext that's uh, involved there. Um, so let's go uh, briefly over a couple of them and then uh, some of them I'll delve into a little bit um, more uh, in, in depth. Um, the decision making, uh, it should be based on evidence. Um, so always keep those skills of the, the ISO products. All these uh, things are really good. Full team member, multidisciplinary, um, and everybody should contribute. Uh, everybody's there for a reason. So you want everybody to contribute uh, with all their experience, their background, their formal training, um, and uh, the knowledge of the, the actual company. Um, so uh, I can just grab the computerizing, uh, the uniformity, and the standardized uh, templates right away, uh, just like every other ISO um, system. You want to put everything on the computer. It's easily retrievable. Uh, you can grab, uh, look at the history. Uh, you can distribute very easily. Um, really important to have it uniform and standardized templates. Uh, people know where to look. Um, you know, they know what should be filled in, where to find it. You know, time is uh, is money, so you don't want them to get frustrated and look and maybe even throw the document away. So keep all of these things uniform, especially the header. So let's go into uh, a few more details of, of these parameters. Project ratings can be quantitative or qualitative. This is where the big problem um, with communication uh, starts, is top management always wants to talk dollars and cents. That's um, on the left side, your quantitative. And on the right side, your qualitative is the probabilities, the risks. Uh, you know, will this machine break down? Will, um, you know, these people not be able to, to make work. So the probability of these things uh, happening. So how do they, they talk to each other is generally when you understand uh, what you're looking for and how you're coming together, um, this is a great chart to, to look at. So on the qualitative, you always want to perform it. How likely is it to, to happen? And um, you can go into some of the other um, PFEMAs um, and look to see their new risk management system there. Always perform it. Um, it's fairly subjective um, based on the, the experience that you, that someone has had in the area. Um, and it's very quick to do because uh, people do have that experience. Um, and these are individual risks that are, um, that are evaluated. So 
um, they're not complicated uh, one on top of the other. On the quantitative side, you know, people are talking about um, costs and scheduling. So scheduling comes down to money coming in, money going out. So again, this is very, very financial based. Um, it's a numeric um, estimate. Again, um, it's optional in the ISO uh, quality management system now, but I encourage you to step up your risk management system and bring all of these um, uh, into uh, into your risk management uh, system. Um, it'll show you uh, the risk exposure. It'll uh, give you a lot more detail, but it's still just an estimate because you know, as time progresses, things get more expensive. Things may or may not be available at the time. So again, these are all risks that you you want to put in. I'm going to um, table objective to the next slide and because what one person thinks is, is uh, their objective, the other person says they're not objective. So here's a really great um, risk tolerance um, game that you can uh, play with uh, everyone is if you draw this line and put um, just a number of different um, uh, after oh, I want to say after school activities uh, just you know your vacation time what would what would you do on your vacation time how would you um, you know how comfortable would you be with the, each of these activities and uh, then you can see just how well someone is willing to, to take that risk. And you can see um, just exactly where someone is a little bit too um, cautious and the top management may or may not see that uh, as being in the, the business strategy and they'll ask you to, to push your limits or be a little bit more conservative if you're really um, off the, the edge of the chart. So that's a really good risk ranking um, exercise. Now, objectivity is based on what you've done before and what you're comfortable with. That is where you are going to say, yes, I'm comfortable with it. And yes, um, it's uh, tolerable. So um, objectivity is a, a myth. All the data is interpreted and all the interpretations rely on um, what your experience is, what your perceptions are, and so on. So that's a really good uh, one to have. So moving later along, uh, we've got the key risk indicators. So we had all of the, the table of the, um, the risks all scattered. So I want you to um, group them. So one suggestion is to group everything in-house, so your sales and operations, and then another group can be the supply management, and you can um, check the effectiveness and the, the efficiency. And then the third is all the support, so your HR, your IT, your finance and regulatory. Uh, again, this is just a suggestion, um, but if one, um, one area is uh, at risk, then it usually affects the rest in that particular group. So that's what I want you to, to focus on. So some good uh, KRIs are, you know, the ability to measure the right thing. Again, this is where the experience um, and the skill of the person um, or the team uh, comes in and knows what to, um, what to measure, how to measure it, what's acceptable, um, and what's capable of being measured um, and how precise and accurate can it be. And again, we want to try to bring that into a dollars and, and cents uh, type of uh, profit and loss. And it, can it be validated? If someone else comes in, um, are they going to also say it's a good KRI zone? So just over a matter of comparison, the um, the KPIs, the key performance indicators, are a measure of how well something is being done, whereas these key risk indicators are an indication of the um, possibility of future adverse um, impacts. Okay, so let's jump into resilience, and this is where the um, 
risk management system really needs that big layer. So what is resilience? If you're if you have a question about risk, you think flow documents. But if you ask a question about resilience, you start thinking about how to get it done. So resilience is the ability to flourish in the face of a disaster risk. And the coping capacity is just the ability to face and manage those disasters. So we'll take um, the four key features of resilience robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness, and rapidity. Robustness is just the um, ability to maintain the critical operations and the functions in the face of uh, crisis. So does that mean that you have uh, duplicate lines? Does that mean you know that you can make 80% um, of your contract? What is it? What does that um, mean to you? So it's going to be individual for each company resourcefulness have you prepared and responded and managed a crisis and disruption as it unfolds have you done it just on paper um, it's a really good desktop um, activity to do as well uh, resourcefulness um, I just mentioned the um, um, rapid recovery is just the ability to get back up so if we look Remember that operations graph, just how far to get up to the 80% or what's acceptable or uh, fully normal again. And redundancy again is we have two lines. If you have a backup, if you can go to a third party and subcontract that out, um, things like this. So why do you want to be resilient? Um, it should be very, very apparent right now in the face of this global crisis. Um, so how are you going to get back to normal very quickly? So some of your supply chains might be down. Maybe you've had to, to switch feet to, to try to, to get that. Sometimes some of the uh, plants have changed entire um, productivity and now you're going to have to change back to your other products. Uh, after or maybe you don't want to but there could be some other disasters too um, weather um, and so on well let's go into the next slide and I'll take each one of these um, ideas uh, individually uh, it could be a cyber attack or a data breach or an outage of ITs or any other could be terrorism or vandalism or theft or fraud is a very big one as well. I know there's a lot, a lot of companies have very big departments just for um, for fraud, uh, just to um, minimize and reduce it. Um, but this is in excess of uh, what you've already um, have in, um, on the on the boards. Um, it could be uh, a number of uh, people uh, not returning to, to work. Uh, my favorite is that they uh, all the, win the, the lottery. They all, all 20 people went in on the same ticket and they all went. And that has happened before. And I did teach a class in um, one uh, place that, that actually happened to the year before. So that was uh, quite coincident, coincidental. Um, could be a, a health and safety incident. Um, uh, or uh, a fire. So um, VUCA, what does VUCA stand for? It's adopted from the military and brought into business. It stands for volatile, volatile uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So that's VUCA. So similar to vulnerability, resilience can be discussed um, in terms of economic, social, health, cultural, environmental resilience and so it helps to understand the, the different components of, of resilience so economic um, is a government and anti-corruption risks there's transparent transparency the labor risks so you don't want people going into poverty and you don't want to have the unavailable uh, labor um, so any kind of uh, downturns in the global economy or the national economy, um, any natural or man-made disasters, um, closure of a major supplier, changing climate, etc. 
Uh, social could be, um, you know, uh, labor issues or human rights violations, um, things like this. Health and sa safety, of course, or sanitary conditions, or um, very big is the, the cranes and the bulldozers, electric shock, road traffic, and so on. Uh, cultural, um, any kind of um, historic or cultural heritage site. So if you don't adapt your business model to the local market, or if there's a regional uh, difference in the culture, if there's a misunderstanding of the local legal or ethical issues, um, and um, I know that a lot of people will take, uh, say for instance, uh, Canadian uh, law and they will adapt it to around the world. So uh, Ford is one of them and I don't like to single out Ford. I just happen uh, to know that they, they're loaded, located outside of Toronto. Um, but uh, these are things that if you like a, a law in one area um, and it's very good and the other laws uh, in other countries don't match up to it, you know, you can bring the law up so that it is, especially for uh, uh, child labor and, and things like that. So I encourage you to uh, bring those into your risks as well. Uh, could also be the cultural problems could also be a weak market share or some missed opportunities, any kind of legal challenges um, and damage it to your reputation. Um, so you don't want to be like uh, some of these other automotive places that uh, came and then they've had a lot of recalls um, because they just didn't um, recognize the local law. Environmental, um, these are quite common um, knowledge, uh, uh, emissions from water pollution, fuel and oil leaks or air pollution, that would be uh, noise and vibration, um, any material waste or byproducts, natural hazards and climate shocks. Uh, for instance, a mudslide. Um, also, the sustainable replenish of materials. And remember when you bring in the materials, how do you um, get rid of the packaging and so on. Um, also, uh, getting back to social, um, could be some community projects, could be awareness raising activities or uh, charity activities as well. So these are very good for reputation as well. So. Lots of things, lots of reasons why resilience does matter. So there's a lot of different approaches and tools and methods to make an assessment. Um, for instance, a technological capacity, speed and breadth of the innovation, um, skills and education levels and the flow of that information and knowledge. So even though it's available, do people really understand it and can they apply it as well? Uh, economic status and gross prospects, uh, the quality of the environment and the natural resource management institutions. Um, I know around the Great Lake, I think there's, uh, if there's not 26, there used to be and it's grown now, just the environmental resource around the water. Um, so there's a lot of things to, to help you out. Um, political structures and processes, and also the infrastructure. So um, the methods of risk uh, are usually um, either subjective processes, objective processes, uh, relative and absolute risks assessment. Um, they could even be probabilistic or deterministic uh, risk assessments. So you'll want to look for the acceptable minimal level of operations. So when you're looking at the layoffs, um, you're looking at the number of lines operational. Um, again, with the layoffs, can they uh, be brought back or are they going to search out other um, people? It's a lot to train. It's a lot to find. Um, it's a lot to um, um, have people that will that will come and stay so keep those in mind um, and of course any financial and uh, the customer needs to uh, so again when you have a good relationship with your customer you can find out you know what can we really rely on they might be also coming um, when when they get the uh, the widgets that you're sending them they might uh, 
need a reduction as well. So even though you might be able to uh, be normal, they might not be. So it could be that little bit of imbalance as well. And um, so you want to prioritize those business functions in a formal risk assessment, okay? So if you write it down, when, when you have a, a thought, um, it might seem clear, but when you write it down, it's very, very, very clear. And then, of course, it, it can be shared with everybody. Uh, so um, the risk assessment will identify and analyze the business risks and the associated threats. So um, we want to go through a formal risk assessment um, a process you know, answer questions like, what's the mission and vision of the organization? Who are the customers? Um, is it important to determine um, how much you can bend before you break? Some parts of the daily operation of your organization are more flexible than others. So when it breaks down, what needs that oil first? Business resilience planning relies on identifying essential functions and prioritizing what is critical uh, so it can be performed in these times of distress. Remember when you are stressed in those times, you don't have the luxury of all of this planning that can be just executed bang, bang, bang. The added um, stress will definitely um, cloud your, your thinking. So also understand what your vulnerabilities are so you can prepare to stay in, uh, pro in, in business. This is comparable to putting the quality alert on your job description at a single station. So if the widget or the part of the company isn't cared for with a particular note to ensure the care in a particular area, the weakest post points are the most sensitive areas. So let's come back to our resilience graph. Um, I called it the operations uh, graph before, but um, it's only operations when it's normal. Otherwise, struggling operations aren't uh, desirable. So uh, some event has uh, happened. You want to assess what's down, what part is broken, uh, how much of that company is impacted. So. Between three and four, that can have all kinds of uh, wiggles and, and so on. We don't, uh, at this point in time, we don't care um, to comment or anticipate or identify the crisis, just that it occurred and that there could be these fallouts. Okay, so this is how your flexibility is uh, starts to expand. So if there's a crisis in one area, what is going to happen with the, the rest of the, the areas. So you make a, a checklist of man, machine, materials, environment, and all the other M's that you want to uh, do if you don't do 4M, if you do 6M, and so on. Um, as well as the processes, any kind of process, handoffs, any needs to be addressed, and um, based on what's been affected and, and how it can be attended to now. So this is, of course, a desktop exercise. And it's a necessary desktop exercise. You want to virtually shut down each part of your organization and think about what will it take to recover, both financially and the type and quality of your resources. And then combine a few processes to see if the time is the same or shorter or longer. Uh, so keeping in mind the improvement principles and ensure that Every top manager has had enough input to evaluate and reevaluate time and resources to return to at least the acceptable number four and also reduce that time frame from four to five. So justify each time and resource. So now you can graph each scenario into a resilience rating versus cost graph. What are the costs when you shorten the time? Uh, use a variety of resources, hire extra um, consultants or temporary workers uh, to bring back that normalcy to reality. And as you can see in the evidence very clearly, where you're throwing money out and the recovery scheme is actually um, just not uh, acceptable anymore. So you want to find that resilience acceptance threshold, that purple line for the best cost to benefit analysis. 
Uh, so uh, here's a table, um, the traditional way of looking at the risk in an enhanced version of risk-based thinking. How long to recover, where, whose control, the historical basis, impact, ability to identify risks, focus on risk and responses, the ability to avoid risks, the grasp of costs, and the mitigation. So you can see a great big um, stretch between the uh, traditional and the enhanced. The traditional has a uh, very short term and the um, uh, have a, has a really short term recovery time compared to the enhanced, which uh, may be longer and might be an uncertain time frame as well. So the traditional, you're looking at just discrete areas, where the enhanced, you're looking at multifaceted, anything that's interconnected and multi dimensions in the within the company. Who's control the traditional, you can usually attend to it in-house, whereas enhanced, you might have to get uh, something, um, some kind of uh, contractor uh, outside or some expertise and rely on others. On um, looking at the history, traditional is usually based on history and what it took before, uh, usually from the lessons learned, whereas the uh, enhanced might be difficult to find that historical precedence again and I hate to bring this up this um, current pandemic that we're we're now facing um, I didn't uh, ability to identify risks um, in the traditional way they're usually specific and known um, but in the enhanced they might be difficult to define clearly and again that's why I say not necessarily what the risk is, just that it happened and how to uh, recover from that. So the focus of the risk responses is, um, in the traditional sense, either reducing or um, uh, removing the entire impact, where as the enhanced, you're going to prepare to manage after an event, uh, an event has occurred and capitalize on those recovering opportunities. Don't forget some of these uh, will be positive. So that old um, that old quote, make la lemonade out of lemons. So are you able to avoid risks? Uh, usually a feasible response in the traditional method, um, but um, you might have a difficult time avoiding ris risks completely. And again, um, if they have a a positive uh, opportunity, uh, you may not want to, or you may might want to limit the risks in order to, to bring some of these um, opportunities out. Now, what kind of costs are we talking? In the traditional sense, you can probably estimate it, but in the enhanced, it might take you a lot longer. And again, this is where um, the, the last two graphs the uh, scenario versus resilience rating versus uh, costs and the resilience graph really come into play. Uh, mitigation uh, can be built into the quality plan, whereas um, in the enhanced, uh, you're going to want to um, be adaptive and just be able to um, dance around like a, a boxer and just make sure that whatever move happens, you're able to cope with it. So that's the flexibility of everything. The evolution. Um, a risk, um, adapt the, the process, um, whatever it is, okay? So you've got your risk management system and you're evolving with resilience and then you're looking at another um, process and then you're migrating it to more than one process and a uh, few um, people and machines are down. And now we're looking at a lot of different um, 
attacks from different areas. So you want to, you want to uh, be able to adapt um, in any kind of uh, climate, social and environmental. And make sure that uh, you've got uh, the, the governance. So not only is it legal, but you might have some opportunities uh, the government might be giving you some kind of grants or loans uh, specific to this. So really capture those things. Um, um, anticipate change and collaborate on the risk mitigation. So again, collaborate, multidisciplinary team. Might be more than just the um, team management. You might need those experts. Um, see the opportunities. Again, might be something positive, might be something and again, if everyone in the round room um, speaks up, they can say, hey, but what about this? And then you can also uh, say, oh, well, that gives me an idea. So again, this brainstorming with opportunities will also uh, bring about uh, good events afterwards. Um, measure the value of the strength and resilience. Can you put a cost on it? Can you put a time frame on it? That's very, very important to, um, to be able to um, be flexible. If it's too costly, and again, when you're going to be revisiting these things, maybe that solution is no longer viable and you've gotten something else. There might be a, an innovation or an IT or technology breakthrough that you can um, incorporate into this new um, enhanced system. Uh, your business uh, continuity plan will frame the ability to respond, resume, and recover. Okay, so you went into uh, business for the, the reason of um, making money and to be able to contribute to society. And once an event happens, you still want to be able to do those things as well. So resume as quickly as you can and recover because people are counting on you. An emergency response plan is not enough. There's many, many other um, um, plans to go through. Oh, I had a whole list of them and I can't find them right now. Oh, here we go. Um, could be a bus business uh, impact analysis, essential functions, you want to define them and prioritize them. Um, all your vital records, again, um, this is where the redundancy of all of your IT and your um, offsite uh, data really comes into play. Um, your risk assessment, the risk management plan, uh, the readiness handbook. Um, if you have an alternate site, um, you know, especially with these uh, larger com uh, corporations, if they have 60-40, uh, where they do some of the um, some of the operations off-site, you might want to be able to ramp up. So know what the level is that your businesses, uh, each geographical uh, plant, can uh, rise up to to take over. Um, the communications plan, any delegation of authority. So what does this mean? In case someone is not able to come or they win the million dollars uh, lottery and they decide not to, to come back, who's uh, next in line, who, who is able to um, understand and who has been um, part of the plan and can take over readily. Uh, the incident command structure, um, that's really uh, very, very important. Any kind of incident, um, as we all know, um, needs a, um, a check uh, to make sure that everybody is good. Any kind of succession plans. Again, these all roll into uh, to one big one there. These uh, key items are all um, part of uh, this business continuity plan. Um, and of course, the return to normal operations plan. So basically, hope is not a strategy. 
that's what I'm trying to get at here with all of these different elements of the business continuity plan. So I'm running on along, so I'm just going to keep moving along and just show you that a business uh, resilience planning to go can go into a PDCA. Everybody is very used to a PDCA plan, do, check, act uh, cycle. So we've got our essential functions in the business impact analysis, our prioritization of threats in our risk assessment, and then we can start doing. We build those uh, uh, procedures in the, um, in the handbook, and we do some training and exercise and ready that workforce and check, make sure that everybody is ready and do that continual uh, improvement. Continual, again, is as it happens, not waiting for the event to happen before you, you move on. Always, always, always trying to um, do a continual improvement and then act. You want to um, incorporate those and you want to uh, replan, redo, recheck, react. So, um, opportunities. These are some opportunities that you, um, just some samples that I've uh, put up there that you don't um, perhaps think about um, as the um, core operations. These are extraneous. So, for instance, this um, pandemic, um, people have some rest and relaxation. They don't have the stress of the traffic. They can wake up. They can work in their pajamas at home. There's all kinds of things that people are more relaxed and they can attend to those um, those duties a little bit more. Or maybe they are off for that little bit of break. When they come back, they come back with more energy. Um, you can tell by this long period of um, either reduced or limited hours or um, total shutdown that it is easier for you in the future to um, be able to plan these uh, shutdowns, cleaning, maintenance, except, uh, etc. They aren't quite as um, uh, stressful as they used to be. Um, if you wanted to change out for repurposing plants, um, there's a lot of plants that have done this before. Uh, uh, before today, so in the last couple of weeks, uh, this might be the first time that they've uh, they've changed out and they've gone through that. And so now, when they're um, putting uh, new um, uh, new widgets on their their line, uh, future vehicles, and so on, they can see just how easy uh, that is for that change out. Um, practice job setup. So don't forget again after any kind of uh, shutdown, um, you're going to uh, do that job setup. So the job setup, of course, is a reminder, uh, some awareness training or some formal training to get people back up just so that quality for the first uh, uh, couple of shifts or co first couple of hours are um, high quality as well. Uh, I mentioned the employee enthusiasm and um, also a closer quality inspection. So um, I'm going to suggest that on uh, future job descriptions and um, enhance them so that everyone has a chance to um, audit. Uh, and I'm saying this for all the quality managers who have a hard time trying to find internal auditors. So with that, I just want to leave you with this uh, one last quote from Larry, Louis Pasteur. He has enhanced um, the Boy Scouts Be Prepared and to say that chance favors the prepared mind. Uh, thank you. Stay safe and all the best when you turn to your business and hopefully with more opportunities presented at your feet. Back to you, Mike. Well, thank you, Donna Stockwell, for that perspective on risk and resiliency. And that concludes this presentation.